because we have like a lot of track riders who are going for um the Omnium in Madison, which is like a day before. So we're not having um Georgia, Alex or our main sprinters. Uh so I'm now <laughs> in that role, which is okay, but like I'm personally on like the flatter stages. I would much rather be doing the lead out for Georgia or something. But uh, yeah, that will be my role for most of the days. G'day Legends and welcome back to the Press Room Podcast presented by Zwift Legends. Welcome to the first episode of the Watch the Femme series, the first of five special episodes with special guests all about this year's Tour de France Femmes. And yeah, well, today, as you're listening right now, the first stage is on. The Tour de France Femmes begins and it begins in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam, more or less. And I tell you what, we just arrived in Rotterdam, in Rotterdam Central, and where all the shops and you know there's a train station and it's all going off. It's almost like the main city square, and there is Tour de France Femmes stuff everywhere, like the livery. There's stickers on the shop front walls. Uh, there's you know bus backings on all the bus stops. The trams even have a full Tour de France Femmes tram wrap. They have not pissed anything out and uh, you certainly couldn't miss that it's on uh, here in Rotterdam and very very excited to see the stage kick off today and I tell you what by the way before we uh, introduced our guest make sure you're following the Instagram account of the Press Room Podcast. Follow our Instagram account because we will be posting some really cool behind the scenes story footage um, on the socials and in stage one in fact today's stage we have VIP access at the finish line which I'm very excited about. Uh, you will know how I love food. I'm very excited to see what's on offer on the smorgasbord. Um, but also, there should be some pretty cool viewings that we'll share on the socials. So make sure you're following us and share it with anyone else you think will enjoy it. Now, Legends, we had to start with a sprinter because the stage one, well, it's a sprint. It's going to be bloody hard, but it is a sprint nonetheless. So our first guest is... Ruby Roseman Gannon, the Australian National Road Champ, uh, National Criterium Champ as well. And we welcome Ruby back on right before she was headed to the Paris Olympics. So we had a good chat about the Olympics in this episode and how it compares to the Tour de France fans. You know, there's that age old question of prestige. Would you take a Tour de France stage win or would you take an Olympic medal? And it's a very interesting question and one that Ruby answers. Uh, in this pod and then we discuss the stages the first three stages uh, specifically uh, the ones that are in Rotterdam because if you look on the profiles uh, the stage profile the parkour they look easy they look flat they look short piece of piss but guess what they're actually a lot harder than they look there's lots of turns they're twisty some of the roads are narrow we're in the netherlands there could be wind there's uh wind turbines everywhere they are everywhere uh for a reason so there's more to these stages than meets the eye so ruby gives us her insight there she's been doing a lot of research and it's just an all in all fun episode i know you guys will love it now legends we must say thank you to zwift of course the reason why the Tour de France Femmes uh, is here. A uh, big part is because of Zwift, and you'll hear that in another episode with another guest as a part of this series, so look out for that. And, of course, FE Sports. We love FE. Um, everybody's heard of the Favero Asiomas. Now, they are the best, the GOAT power meter pedal, but did you know they also do a mountain bike version of that pedal now, uh, which, of course, is made to be durable for... Um, well, all your off-road needs. So, yeah, if you're looking for a power meter on the MTB, uh, certainly recommend for Vero. Check out GP Llama, uh, the great man Shane. He's got a review on them on his website somewhere, and that just tells you all you need to know. Accurate, reliable, for Vero. They know what they're doing. And finally, Cyclic. Check out the Fly 6 Pro. It is a dash cam for cyclists. The rear camera light combo. Uh, you can use the description I always say that. You can use the link in the description and you can also save 10% off using TPR10. So check out the Fly 6 Pro if you need a rear light and camera combo to keep you safe out on the roads. 
All right, legends, it's time. It's the first, the first episode of the Watch the Fem series. I can't wait to drop the next one for you, and I'll see you on the other side. Making it to the Olympics in any sport is like massive. And maybe cycling is one of those sports where it's maybe isn't the 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 peak of the sport. You know, it's usually like the Tour de France. For, how does it feel for you? Does the Olympics feel like it is the top? Um, thing that you could achieve or, or compete in as a cyclist? Yeah, we actually, at our dinner table, we were doing, like, would you rather's? <laughs> like, oh, yeah. would you rather Olympic or, like, gold medal or world championship? Yeah. And then, like, also, like, then we would be, like, would you rather, like, Tour de France or whatever? And yeah. I think, like, definitely in our team, like, most people would prefer Tour de France and world championship over mm. Olympic gold. But obviously Olympic gold, like, it's like it has a meaning to everyone, you know, whereas like Tour de France and World Championship are definitely so much bigger in the cycling world. Mm. Um, but but they don't have like a World Championship in cycling, I think, is is bigger than like a World Championship in athletics, for example, because you wear the jersey, you like, it's mm. just such a mm. like iconic thing. But, yeah, personally, I guess going through the – um like the Australian system with the track program and stuff, like Olympic yeah. gold is the pinnacle. So, mm. Yeah, no, for sure. It's just kind of interesting. There's a few sports like this where maybe the Olympics isn't the top, considered the top um, or like the be all end all. Like I was thinking maybe like with football, like soccer, it's probably the World Cup would be for them and maybe golf is another one, probably the Masters and that sort of stuff is um, – another but i mean nevertheless still still really cool um and have uh when you get selected for the olympics do you get sent like a kit of things or have you been sent anything from the team or is that waiting for you in paris i think that's waiting in paris yeah okay okay that's exciting yeah i actually saw i was watching a video earlier i think it was the olympic channel that boxing like this little gift pack that i think the athletes were getting or maybe it was per sport but there was like a phone in there like a samsung phone yeah i think there's like an olympic phone that like some people just don't buy a phone and every cycle when they go to the olympics they just use their next (laughs) olympic phone so (laughs) and i think i can't remember who it is there's someone who really needs a new phone so they're just they were hanging out to the next <laughs> to so next funny. week to get their it's, new phone. So it's good. I mean, as yeah. long as it's like the right, um, uh, you know, if it's a Samsung or an Apple, you know, like as long as you're on the right side of that. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah, I think it's a Samsung. <laughs> okay, all right. Are you a Samsung user or, or an Apple person? I'm an Apple person. Yeah, um, yeah. I've been, yeah, on that Apple train that. I know it's not it's not the best company, maybe not the best thing to have everyone on Apple, but it's just so easy. Yeah. So, yeah. I think Apple is just the easiest to use. Everything works. Yeah, I use Google Maps. I think both have their problems, particularly for riding. Like, especially mm. in Europe, actually. Really? Because it just takes you on some random route and <laughs> yeah, yeah, you get to a no through road and yeah. Yeah. Uh, pretty cool this year when you when you won um, the stage of tour of Britain. That was super cool. I um, I wondered where you put the um, little plaque. You got you got like a plaque. I think with a stage on it or something. What did you do? With yeah, it? it was like it was just like a a printout um, in a frame. Okay. Um, I just put it in my room because I don't have that many trophies to be honest, and I don't have that many things in my room. So I just yeah, chucked it. On top of the heater, actually. Oh, on top of the heater. Nice. Tour of Britain stage too, so it probably needs to be warmed up. But what about um what about all your uh the Australian national plates? Where are they? Oh, they're at home. Yeah. I do have a lot more stuff at home but uh, in Melbourne. But yeah. Yeah, a few of them. I've got a lot of actually like bronze medals from under thirteens in Victoria. (laughs) Let's go. I have, like a, I have a ridiculous amount of like cycle sport Victoria was at the time medals oh. um, and just ran because I did all the junior races like basically from 
under 11s, under 13s, under 15s, under 17s and all the country tours. And like often we only had like three people in the race. So like you kind of guaranteed a medal. (laughs) So yeah, I actually need to like, I hung on to them for a long time, but it's, I think it's about like a 30 kilo box, like Tupperware box full of like random stuff. Yeah. So that's cool. Yeah. It's a throwback when you say the word cycle sport. (laughs) <laughs> that's because yeah. we had that too in WA cycle sport. That's so funny. Um, yeah. So going to the tour, right? Um, this would be second one, which is pretty cool. Um, what did you? Is there anything that you learned from the first one? Any learnings? Um, I guess like I think the the tension is so high, like in the peloton, mm. like particularly on like. Yeah, I just remember, like, the first few days, like, we had in 2022, which was when I last did it, like, the second stage was that really bad one with all the crashes. Like, I, oh, I think there's yeah. still – they're still using some of the crashes as, like, promo <laughs> for the event. But, yeah. um, yeah, it was, like, just really hectic. And yeah. I think looking at the start of Rotterdam, like, yeah. it's going to be, I yeah. think – <laughs> like that but maybe even worse um because yeah. it's flat it's super technical potentially windy and mm-hmm. then you've got like sprinters wanting their chance you've got gc riders wanting to stay out of trouble no and then you've got every other opportunist who wants to just give it a go especially on the first stage because you know the jersey's up for grabs um mm-hmm. you know sprint jersey maybe maybe polka dots i don't know if i haven't seen whether they're going to put a yeah. climb on a bridge or something but yeah, yeah. probably yeah Yes. Okay. So, yeah. And then each year it'll probably be like more and more crazy because it'll just keep getting bigger and bigger. But are the roads that through Rotterdam, are they, because uh, we're going to be there. So I don't know what, I've never been there, there before, but I imagine they'll be pretty narrow what you'll be racing on in Rotterdam. Well, I, I've only sort of briefly looked at it. Rotterdam, like, because it was um, like bombed in, I think, World War Two. Hmm. Or I'm not so good at history, but it's actually a very modern city compared to like Amsterdam. Oh, so cool. it's like, yeah, it has like no, like, I don't know if you've been to Amsterdam, but Amsterdam has like all these like really cute narrow streets and like old buildings. Yeah. Whereas Rotterdam really feels like a very modern city because it's basically like new, Brand new. as of last century. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think it's actually not the smallest roads. Yeah. I think maybe on the outskirts, but I think in the city, they're sort of bigger roads. Mm. Um, but there's like a corner every hundred meters, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And and what do you think about that TT? I mean that. I mean TT. It's the six kilometers. Like that is after you've done a stage too, right? Like that's uh, yeah. Yeah, it's up. actually a throwback to junior tour days, <laughs> like <laughs> the double day in one day. Yeah. I think a lot of people aren't like super keen on that. Um. <laughs> But I think that apparently there's something like the logistics of the tour. Obviously, it's such a busy period because we've got um, Olympics just before and then yeah. afterwards there's Plouet. Um, mm. And I, I think like just logistically to fit all the racing in, mm. apparently they only had like a seven-day window to make it happen. But I think they wanted to keep the eight stages because they don't want to be going backwards in terms of stage number. So yeah. they are like, we'll just chuck two in one day and yeah, lucky like us. But I'm I'm really interested because I think I at Balwa's tour, Lorena won a 15k TT. Uh-huh. Um and I'm like 6k is more her domain. Like I think she's going really well. And yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see her up there. Yeah, oh for sure. I'm just looking at that too, actually. It's an interesting one because 6k, I mean like something like a like a like a original prologue, like a three or four k or something, mm. is kind of cool because it brings in like the sprinters or the lead out riders, um, or yeah, you know, just the maybe the more track athletes. Mm. But um, six k's is almost I don't know even more people could contend for that. Um, yeah, that would be interesting. The warm up will be interesting, um, mm. and I've, especially after you've done a stage like for that, would you be doing? Uh, would you do a your same normal warm up for a short TT like that, or would you do you think you'll change it up because you've already already done a 
120k or 100k? Um, I probably would do like a slightly shorter warm up. Um, but really, like I have sort of a small like three minute on, one minute off, one minute on, one minute off, one minute on, which is sort of just like my go to routine. Um, that I do, like I even do it before like efforts when I'm training, and so I'll I'll keep that, and then it's really like the stuff before and after that I would change in terms of just how I feel, like. Of course, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, like I think usually once you've ridden a bit, like you've sort of loosened up the muscles and like you can sort of get on the bike and feel good quicker. Mm. Mm, uh, and true. particularly if it's hot, then definitely like a shorter warm up because, mm. yeah. But... Mm. Uh, now, your. Uh... Had had you gone? Had you looked at any stages and and maybe picked one out that you think would suit you the best? Yeah, I've had a look. Um, we have like uh, because of the Olympics, our team is probably different to what it would be without the Olympics. Yeah. Um, because we have like a lot of track riders who are yeah really going for um the Omnium and Madison, which is like a day before the tour mm. starts, so we're not having. Um, Georgia, Alex, or Letizia, Maybe. sort of our main sprinters. Mm. Uh, so I'm now <laughs> in that role, which is okay, but, like, I'm personally on, like, the flatter stages. I would much rather be doing the lead out for Georgia or something. Okay. But, uh, yeah, that will be my role for most of the days is sprinter. And then, um, obviously, the particularly the last two or three stages are very – yeah, hard, and I will just be all into do lead-ins for the climbs for the climbers. Mm. Do you, uh, I mean, obviously, maybe on the flat stuff, you, you might not have, might not be able to match the top women with, like, the raw speed, but you can still do, like, if you follow the right wheels, that's still pretty good, or is it? Is it more than, like, the hecticness of those sprints that you would rather be leading out? Is that why you said that? Uh, well, like, honestly, in the hecticness in the lead out, you're also in that. But, um, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess, like, uh, like, I'm, I guess, is pretty, when you're up against, like, Lorena and Charlotte are cool, like, personally, I, it's, I mean, it's not impossible <laughs> to have written, mm -hmm. things happen, yeah. and, like, you know, crazy, mm -hmm. random things happen, but I'm not, like, a pure, pure sprinter that is, like, Yeah, yeah, I can win this stage. Like, it's perfect. So yeah. it's not that I'm not going for the win. Like, I'm going to give it everything I have. And random stuff happens. And if you just put yourself in the right position, you never know. Yeah, but at the same time, like, you know, George's raw sprint power is, like, very, very good. So, yeah. I like, I just want the best result for the team always. So if I'm leading her out, I think that's the best option when we're racing in these situations. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Well, I still, um, it's still an awesome opportunity for you because then you get, you know, you're the you're the one. <laughs> yeah, it's good practice as well. Like, just you know, if you're not normally in that role, then yeah. yeah. Did you have? Did you change any of your training in the lead up when you found out that you would be the sole sprinter? Did you try and maybe you work on? Well, I don't know if you can you can tweak your sprint. A little bit more if you change your training one way or to just keep everything the same? Uh, well, I've had, like, kind of a roller coaster year, as I said. Like, I because yeah. I initially earlier in the year, I had a patellofemoral injury um, mm -hmm. in my knee, like just basically bone bruising, like where the femur meets the patella, mm -hmm. um, which took a while to rehab, but I was hang free on the bike pretty quickly. But okay. just with my gym... I have struggled to build the load without like, yeah, just I have a lot of pain in yeah. that sort of loading that um, joint. So then like the physios are like, don't push it too much. So yeah, I feel like it's been a bit of a battle to get my sprint back a little bit after mm -hmm. that because I lost some quad size as well. Um, but the goal this year has been uh, Olympics and in the Olympics, like sprint's also important. So I have been like really focusing on that last sort of, few months post injury trying to like improve it. and actually the day that I got hit by the car earlier this week I finally like got some like tv numbers <laughs> so then yeah it just it's like yeah it's just the way it is and 
I think it's just been testing me a bit this year. Like, mm-hmm. I guess being more flexible, being more like resilient, just sort of taking it as it comes. And mm-hmm. you could see like a lot of the things as unlucky, but honestly, I feel like extremely lucky. Like I haven't, you know, like I haven't been out for that long. I've been yeah. able to come back and yeah, it's just the way it is. And then like things like Tour of Britain happen and, you know, yeah. <laughs> you just never know. So yeah, of course, of course. And, you know, could have, it could have wiped out both of these goals straight away as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, knees are funny, aren't they? Like I think a lot of cyclists, amateurs and professionals have had issues with that patella, um, you know, that sort of syndrome where it gets inflamed and it just affects everything. And then, yeah, it can be a long process, but that's good that you're able to go back pain-free because um, sometimes it can take forever. Well, you don't know yeah, I was you. really lucky that, like, on the bike, it got better pretty quickly. Like, mm. but then, yeah, yeah, I was. It's just so nice to not have pain when you ride. Like, it's a real, yeah. real luxury. Yeah, it is. It's easy to take it for granted when you're just out there pedaling away, and then anyone who's come back from an injury, like, once you get to that state, and you, you're like feeling it out on the bike on those early rides. Hey, when you just is that hurting? I don't know if it's hurting, but when it doesn't, yeah, it is really good. Yeah. Uh, now I've been asking um other riders that I've been talking to this week these questions, and I think it'd be interesting to see what you have say because you've already raced a Tour de France before. But what does the Tour de France fans need that it doesn't have now? Uh, I think maybe more stages. Like, mm. I think, I don't know. I'll probably say a different answer on, like, the eighth stage of the tour. <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but I think, like, one the one really cool thing about what the Tour de France is, I guess, for the men, is, like, when you have more stages – you can't, the favorites can't go for every stage. Like you have to, you have to pick and choose a bit more. And I feel like for our tour, like if you've got seven or eight stages and you have like 10 to 15 favorites, you know, or like 10 really, really good riders, they all want their win. So it's like, I mean, last year there were more breakaways and more, there was a lot more randomness, but I feel like the cool thing about the men's tour is like you see a break, like you you get these sort of breaks of riders that aren't top, 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 but they get their opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I think having like a two-week stage, like 14 stages, for example, Mm -hmm. would just open up the race a little bit more to opportunistic racing. And I think it's exciting as well. Yeah, for sure. Because that would also open the, open the, or make it available for riders to do maybe in the first week, have a rest. And then the second week they can then target and take it. Yeah, down exactly. Fatigue riders. Yeah. That opens that up. Like, like what the men's do in like the third week. And I too. think like our race, like in 2022, like I've never had such, like I've never experienced anything. Like every day was just like full gas concentration, full gas racing, like right. from the start. And you didn't often get to see the start. I think we had one day where the really, really long day where it wasn't so much like that, but it was still like an hour and a half of trying to get the break going. Yeah. And it was like, and sometimes the break never goes. So then it's like that for the whole race. And yeah, like it would be nice, I think, if we had 14 stages. I think people would chill out for at least a few. <laughs> Bloody hope so. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, good answer. That's it's uh yeah, that is a good answer. What do you what do you think the Tour de France Femmes will look like in 20 years? Do you think it will be the 14 stages or do you think uh is there anything you can picture? Because if if like when I think about 20 years time, I think there will be like a, a much larger corporate sponsor. Um, you know, I think everything will have, I mean, everything is already now, but I think even more so everything will have a sponsor like an F1, every banner sponsored by, you know, a watch company or something, you know, the sprint, every marker has something. I don't know. I think it'll be even more more sponsors in the sport, maybe compared to the men's too. Yeah, potentially. I think, um, well, I think two things. One is like, I guess I, I do sort of feel a little bit concerned about the economic model of cycling, like just mm-hmm. about, I guess, like you have all these teams that are very dependent on like sponsors that have to put in a lot of money and may or may not get that return. Um, 
So I think that's why you see like a fair bit of sponsor changing and stuff. Yeah. And I just wonder if we had like a big economic event, how we would fare as a sport through that. Um, mm. Just because like sponsorship is probably the first thing that a company will drop if they're in financial problems. But in saying that, um, yeah, that's just sort of like in the back of my mind. I think I think we could benefit from like a better financial model where we're getting more money from viewership or mm. I don't know, just a rejigging of that, like more like a traditional sport. Mm. Um, but then I think in terms of like the women's Tour de France fans specifically, I feel like as a like world where definitely progressing like when I grew up racing I remember like the junior boys telling me that watching women's cycling like professional women's cycling was like watching paint dry and like there was just this so much sexism towards women's sport like yeah it just it really really felt like you're second tier like you were sort of just like not as important and like that it wasn't really a viable career and all the stuff and now it is and I feel like we're getting a lot more respect like watching the racing it is really exciting and like we've got some like big personalities and like yeah. I think our Unchained would be pretty like yeah. cool. Like there's a few riders I'd be very interested to like hear yeah. what they've got to say. So yeah. um in that and I and then I also think like in terms of like I feel like actually my housemate Lizzie, she just did a um an article on why women's races are shorter than men's races. Yeah. And um I don't think it's been published yet, but okay. it's um really interesting like why like what is the underlying like sort of reasons that women cannot do what men can do theoretically like okay maybe our speeds are different but why can't we match the kilometers to hours for example like mm. why why isn't our nationals like over four hours mm. like why is it a three-hour race um and like there's lots of arguments for and against but i think we're sort of slowly progressing to the stage like where really like it should be time matched like it shouldn't be there is no reason why we can't do the same time that the men do. Yeah. And I think a really good example of how like sort of superficial the this is is like on the track, it wasn't until this year that um, the 500 existed for women and the k- kilometre time trial existed for men. They're completely different events. Like the difference between a man and a woman would be under 10 seconds for both distances. Huh. But they have like one race which is two laps of the track and one race which is four laps of the track like it's just like the different physiology for the riders like you could have a really 200 meter pure sprinter doing the 500 and then the kilo is like like a sort of an anaerobic even a a tp rider can can do a pretty good kilo and it's like a third wheel event so i feel like we have all this sort of entrenched things from years and years back and like if you read the quotes from like i think some old man said that women couldn't race because their uteruses would fall out because <laughs> things like that. There's a lot of sort of this really old sexism that's still yeah. Yeah. still a little bit in the sport. And I think in two like yeah, two decades time, this will be gone. Like yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think we'll be doing exactly the same as what the men are doing. Oh Ruby, you got great answers. That's so good. Nice. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I agree. I agree. Um when you, when you're doing like a um, sorry, the neighbors just coming home. When you're doing uh, look at Mister Earl there, don't you just love him? Look at him. So I get distracted. He's so <laughs> look at him go. Um, yeah, when you're doing a week long race um, or just any multi day stage race, what keeps you sane during that event, and what drives you crazy? And it might not always be the racing. Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, I think sleep is really important. Mm -hmm. Like when you lose a sleep, that's when you sort of start going crazy. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But I think think your teammates make a big difference as well. Like you want to be around people you like because, you know, they're everywhere with you, like at breakfast, in the bus. So sort of keeping that morale, like obviously there's ups and downs and not every day everyone's going to be feeling great about their performances and stuff. But I guess it's about like letting everyone and yourself feel what you need to feel because sort of hiding that may not actually help you, may make you feel worse. 
but at the same time like managing those emotions so that you're not taking them out on other people um mm-hmm. or like getting super emotional at like like the wrong times um and I think like having a few more like coming to my third year professional it's definitely easier to manage that because I'm a it's a bit more comfortable. Like I know everyone I, you know, um, I know, I guess what to expect also a bit more uh, in a long race, Mm. but still like the last couple of days, if you've been going pretty hard, like for me, my back starts to go a bit, like I sort of, Mm. yeah, you sort of just slowly like go into this like crouching position where like your shoulders are tucked in, your back's bent. And like, it's just from spending so much time, like going hard in that position that you just, but it's really important to have a physio. So Mm. yeah. The last couple of days are often a bit of a, yeah, tricky one, but (laughs) Mm. good to just, yeah, get get it done. And usually the harder it is, the better it is because you don't feel so much. Yeah. Yeah. Have have you raced up or even ridden up, uh, outdoors before no i haven't okay have you seen the climb before outdoors for the last stage look i haven't looked at this stage in depth <laughs> because my job will be done at the base of that climb so for the rest <laughs> i don't need to look at <laughs> oh that's good so, that's yeah. good okay. i think i'll pro- hopefully have a nice group to ride with from then on and then i can enjoy the yeah the yes views. Yeah, for sure. You'll be you'll be able to really enjoy it, and and everyone else in that group for, um, going up it. That's so cool. Um, uh, yeah. Although then the chat starts about time cut, and everyone starts panicking, even though we have like half an hour in us of our sleeve <laughs> at the tour when I did it. It was like every mountain stage. It was like time cut, time cut, and I'm like, there's literally like. 70 people behind us or maybe not quite 70 but like 50 people behind us like i really don't think they're gonna time cut us yeah yeah for sure that's that would that would remind me of like if someone owns like an electric car and they talk about the battery you know or an e-bike they feel, yeah you know, the it's battery funny. um we can make it. <laughs> yeah oh sick yeah i wonder what where do you think would be the better place to spectate on outdoors do you reckon at the bottom in the middle or at the top I don't know. I I think, well, based off my experience in 2022 and looking, watching it last year, the crowds are crazy. Like yeah. the crowds are big. Yeah. Um, so I guess like logistically, if you're going, um, I think it's going to be hard to drive down the climb. So I would mm. park at the base and then ride up to wherever is a good spot mm. um, because, yeah, I think a lot of people are actually staying at the top and staying there that night because I think it, they're yeah. expecting it to be quite difficult to get down. Yeah, yeah. But, I think that's what we're going to do. We're going to go there the night before. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think they have like a big – the rumours are they have a big party there the night before. So wherever you are, if you're at the top uh, or if you're on this corner or that switchback and you're yeah. camping around there, that's party number one. And then like down yeah. the hill – there'll be a different one and you can just like go. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So I hope so. Um, Ruby, thanks again for coming on. Always appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. All right, legends, that's another episode of the Press Room Podcast done and dusted. Thank you so much for listening. I can't wait to share the next episode with you guys. It's going to be super cool. Make sure you follow us on the socials, follow us on Spotify, Apple, all your podcast players, and I'll see you on the next episode. Cheers. Cheers.